In preparing for this presentation today, I was reminded of a story, a true story, of a young boy who had lost his hearing at the age of eight due to a middle ear infection. For nearly 10 years, he was bullied, ridiculed, and made fun of by family members, his peers, and his classmates. In fact, his hearing was so severe in terms of its loss that he failed the fifth grade as a result of poor academic performance. During that time period, he had no less than five experimental surgeries, with the last experimental surgery being performed in 1972 that restored about 55% of his hearing in his left ear and about 60% in his right ear. However, weeks later, after the bandages had been removed, he was horrified by the way he spoke, could not pronounce his R's or his W's. However, his perseverance and tenacity paid off by going to the local college every single day where his sister-in-law was a speech pathologist and practicing and recording until he improved his fluency. A few years later, in 1975, he was voted the most likely not to succeed. He applied to many colleges. Every single college rejected him, classifying him as being disabled. But he convinced one college that that label was inappropriate. And so he entered the class of 1975, graduating in 1979, second highest in his college class. That young boy was me. I don't vividly recall whether it was that long period of pain and suffering or the tragic death of my brother in an automobile accident five years after losing my hearing that gave me that fortitude and that desire to move forward. However, what I came to realize in a book that I will release later this year, that that moment in my life was my caterpillar moment. Yes, caterpillar, because just like a bulldozer, sometimes you need to be knocked down to your core to face the very essence of who you are. Falling down to your knees to either survive or surrender. I don't vividly recall when I decided that I would survive. But during those years when I was bullied and denied the right to be heard, I entered into the quietude of an intellectual curiosity that was fueled by the writings of Senator Robert F. Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King. You see, I admired those two men for their ability to transform their lives amidst such great tragedy and challenges and to emerge as our world's two greatest leaders. You see, life's caterpillar moment has two venues. The first, just like the iconic Caterpillar Corporation that develops heavy-duty machinery that knocks buildings down right to the ground. We have to go through that process. But then you emerge in that other venue of a caterpillar into a butterfly where your full potential emerges. Two years before the great Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw died, he was asked by a reporter to name a famous person whom he missed most, a poet, a teacher, a writer. He reflected for a moment and responded, the person I miss most is the person I could have become. What I learned during my experience is that I'm not eager to do great things. My desire is to do little things that have the capacity to drive great change. And so my story today is one of two paths and two venues. 
It is about my professional passion and my personal passion and how it is important to integrate the two if you want to become everything you want to be. My professional passion emerged six months following the restoration of my hearing in 1972. My sister-in-law, who I had alluded earlier, was my speech coach, and she happened to be pregnant that year with her second child. On July 21st, 1972, what should have been a happy moment for our family turned into tragedy. Rosemary died giving birth to her second child as a result of a medication error. Today, more than 100,000 people die because of a medication error. It is equivalent to the unsafe landing of six jumbo jets each week. And so for the last 37 years, I have devoted my life to trying to make a difference in healthcare. I will admit to you that I started off first as an innovator in 1997. I co-founded the organization called Protocare. It was a data aggregation company because I really felt that the physician who was on duty that evening treating my sister-in-law did not mean to do any harm. But he lacked the data, the information, so I had this brainstorm idea, could we aggregate data and make it available? And it emerged in the early 2000s to one of the largest drug surveillance programs. But I realized that we lacked the technology, we lacked the delivery platform. And so rather than research and develop, which is innovation, I decided I would spend the rest of my professional career searching and developing. And so from 2004 to 2009, I spent those five years looking around and understanding, could I develop a technology integration of companies that would deliver the information in 2008, we launched Physicians Interactive, which today is known as Aptus Health. We provide medical content to three and a half million providers across the world. Let me exemplify the magnitude of that platform. Two and a half years ago during the Ebola crisis, I was frustrated that we were not getting education out to physicians and providers across the world. And so I decided I would just rely on what we've always done. Let's form a coalition. Let's bring other companies together. And in one week, we flipped the light switch and we distributed information to more than two million healthcare providers across the world. So the situation that happened to my sister-in-law would not happen to other people. It is about integration, not just innovation. My personal passion emerged on September 11, 2001, by far one of our nation's saddest days, a day that changed all of our lives and changed my life personally. You see, the company Protocare that I had started was based in Los Angeles. And every week I made that trip from Boston to Los Angeles, and September 11th would not have been any different. But the day prior, call it fate, I woke up with a toothache and decided I would leave Monday night because my dentist was not far from the Boston Logan Airport. However, my two friends and their three-year-old son, who were visiting my home, my summer home in Maine, decided that they had changed their flight once for me. They were not going to do it again. And unfortunately, they lost their lives as United Flight 175 hit the second tower of the World Trade Center. I will not deny on this stage here today that that life's caterpillar moment literally destroyed me. I couldn't understand how anyone could muster up the evil to take the life of a three-year-old. Why was my life saved and my friends were not? But the beauty of life's caterpillar moment is you extract those golden nuggets that helped you get through every single challenge. And so rather than have hatred in my heart, rather than wallow in the grief, I decided that my personal passion had not been tapped into at that point. And so in the fall of 2001, in memory of my friends, we launched the Tremuto Foundation, 
which this October will celebrate 15 years of helping dozens and dozens of young children who have had disabilities like myself pursue their educational dream to become all that they can become. Seven years ago, we changed the vision and now we are supporting hundreds of organizations across the world to realize their vision to make the world more just and fair. We haven't stopped there, and that's one of the benefits that you learn in terms of integration, that it is not about the event, it is about the aggregation of events. In 2009, one year after we started Physicians Interactive, I was heading to Europe and I was on a plane reading an article, the content of which is still etched in my memory here today, that in our lifetime, one billion people will go to their graves prematurely because they lacked access to clean water, to medication, and to a healthcare worker. Six million are children who die each year. Some have shared with me that that's not our problem, Donato. I disagree. Article 25 of the Declaration of Human Rights states that healthcare is a basic right for every single person, and when one person has not had access to that right, we have violated the Declaration. <laughs> and so, I decided I would take on that challenge. And I struggled as to whether or not I should be the innovator or should I be the integrator. And then I was in India and I came across some statistics that India, a population of 1.2 billion people, 45% don't have toilets, 65% have mobile phones. There's 700,000 physicians in that population, the same amount of physicians that we have in the United States for one fourth the population. And then the light bulb went off. Why could we not use our technology from Physicians Interactive and bring it to those countries because you're never gonna be able to educate enough physicians and nurses to address the problem. And the results have been astounding. We launched in 2011. We celebrated the fifth anniversary in New York two months ago. We launched a new organization by the name of Health E Villages. It stands for Heal the Villages. And the results have been astounding. In Kenya, in a small village, Two and a half hours from Nairobi, a small village by the name of Lawala, a population of 50,000 people. In 2012, the infant mortality was 100 deaths per 1,000 births. Less than 25% of the pregnant mothers actually deliver their babies in a community health center. And when they did want to go to the community health center, they were wheelbarrowed miles and miles and died on the way. And so the idea hit me, could we partner with the community health center? But we couldn't bring more doctors in, but could we go into the villages and educate the villagers? Just because you are poor does not mean you don't have the capacity to have an intellect. We educated 85 of the villagers who now identify who the pregnant women are. I was there two and a half weeks ago and gave Lillian a hug. Lillian was our first recipient who we brought into the program. In fact, this is right here, her, her, her little baby that I'm holding. We brought her into the program in 2012. She went into the home and it was so funny, the first thing we had to train the local care coordinator was how to turn the iPad on. But once they turned the iPad on, then we had our medical app on pregnancy. And they identified that Lillian may have preeclampsia, which is a severe case of hypertension in a pregnant woman. And so we brought her into the community health center and then she was diagnosed with twins. And they said that she would not be alive today nor would that, those twins be alive if it wasn't for the fact that we identify them. Infant mortality has been reduced down to 30 deaths per 1,000 births. 70 more babies are alive today because of healthy villages and collaboration.
the solution of one problem begets another. What we learned was now pediatric mortality increased because more babies now were alive. And so now we have a new program called Thrive to Five, and we've cut pediatric mortality in half with the same program by collaborating with the local community health center. A year ago, a year ago I went off, off to Haiti to inspect the program there. And as we were walking down the corridor of a hospital, I heard this loud roar and scream. And being the product of hearing loss, I was curious to understand what was going on. And I had asked the nurse who was with me, what is that? And she hesitated to respond at first. And she said, it is the scream of a young boy. They are resetting his leg without pain medication. That, to me, is unacceptable. We call ourselves the human race. The next day, we were not going to innovate. The next day, we were going to integrate. We brought those 20 nurses together in a room. We brought our Healthy Villages coordinator in. We immediately got 20 iPads and downloaded them with pain management protocol and made sure the pharmaceutical companies stocked the hospital so that no young boy or girl should ever go through an experience like that five-year-old. And, <laughs> that is what collaborative integration is. We are not trying to realize great things here. We are trying to do little things that have the capacity for great change. I just returned from Kenya two and a half weeks ago. When I was to finish a project that I started two and a half years ago, you see, when I was there two and a half years ago, I walked across the maternity ward. And even though we have now increased the delivery of babies by mothers to 97%, you see in a 12 by eight room, there were 12 to 15 mothers there about ready to deliver their babies. Who in this room here would trade places with a woman in Kenya with conditions like that? And we asked, what could we do? And they asked, could you use your contacts to raise the money to build a new maternity ward? My father once said, be happy if you have as many friends as the number of fingers on both of your hands. I have been grateful that God has given me many, many hands. We raised the money and returned two and a half, year, two and a half weeks ago to open up the hospital so that a pregnant woman will have a bed and will have the privacy that she deserves in the delivery of her baby. In closing, the great educator Horace Mann once said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. If I could move from being voted as the most likely not to succeed to being on this stage today, I know that each and every one of you can tally that victory and join us all in the cause to make the world more just and fair by integration and collaboration. Thank you so much.